Okay, so that's actually a really good uh, introduction for what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to focus more on, uh, so by open access, it, it means two things. You know, it can mean open access to all kinds of things, uh, source, data source, you know, information from the government, uh, educational materials. But when we just say open access, we typically mean open access to peer-reviewed journal articles. Uh, so I'm going to talk specifically about that. And uh, first, so... There's going to be people in this room who knows a lot about this. There's going to be people who maybe know a lot less. So bear with me. I'm kind of going to try to give everyone a fair grounding. Um, very brief go through and simplification of traditional models of publishing. If you publish an article, right, you're an author or you have a, a team of authors, you submit your paper to an editor. Now, the editor, if he thinks it's decent enough, will probably send it to some peer reviewers. They might send it back to you and say, well, that was good, but need to make some rev uh, revisions. So that goes around a few times, and, and maybe in the end you have a product that everyone's happy with. And it goes for copy editing and layout. It gets published. And you have some readers who either directly or typically through their institution, through their library, pay money to access that material. Now, if we just look at this, and I know this is very simplified, but the key, key point here is where does the money go? Okay, if you look at the author, they don't get any money. Uh, the editor typically is unpaid. Sometimes they have some small perks, but typically it's not a full-time position unless maybe it's funded by a university or, so, or some such. The peer reviewers are certainly unpaid, although, granted, this is part of their job description as, as academics, but um, what I'm saying is they're not being paid by the journal. Uh, copy editing and layout is typically paid. And so this money that the readers put into this journal, or the libraries, the institutions put into this journal, uh, money that is um, actually a lot more than we think, because we're typically not paying it by ourselves, and which is, is increasing very, very rapidly, um, goes then to the commercial publisher and to those, those services that we mentioned. So my point is that the years of research that the, the research group spent on this and the professional services of almost everyone involved in this is not remunerated from the income from the readers. However, this um, pay, uh, paywall, as you can call it, is blocking out an, a very large array of people. And we're gonna talk about that. So these people who are involved in the process, they typically want as many people as possible to read their work, both because it's something they've been working on for years and something they're passionate about, and because Pragmatically, they want people to cite them, and they want to have influence in the field. Um, so they have a problem with this structure. Uh, and because, as Cable Green explained, we now have the means available, we have the legal infrastructure, and we have the technological infrastructure to distribute this information in a way that we just didn't have 20 years ago. If you had to print paper journals, you needed a whole different kind of apparatus that needed to be funded at a different level. So given these new possibilities, you know, how can we kind of change the way that we publish information that is typically, of course, the money coming in here, uh, largely state funding, so it's taxpayers' money, right? How can we use the research coming out of taxpayers' money and give all the taxpayers and everyone else access to it? So that's the basic um, problem statement. Now, as I said, a lot of these researchers are unhappy that the material that they're putting out is not available to people. And so just about a year ago, uh, we had this really interesting uh, event where a thousand of scientists vowed to boycott Elsevier. Um, they wouldn't publish there, they wouldn't review for Elsevier, and that actually had some impact. But, so that's one way that you could possibly impact this, and I'll talk about other ways. But talking about open access, I want to just uh, focus on three key questions. What is it? How does it work? Uh, why do we want it? I mentioned a little bit, I'll go on a few more uh, details. And then how can we get there? Right? And I think that maybe the third question is what we'll spend a bit more time on later in the discussion, but I'm happy to answer questions about either three parts. So how does open access work? Typically, we separate open access into green open access and gold open access. And um, green open access means that you can publish in any journal that you want. Okay, because that's something that often makes academics quite antsy when you talk about open access is, oh, you're going to tell me where to publish? Um, in fact, with, with green open access, no, you publish in the journal that you want to, the one that has high impact factor and is, is well known in the field, but you self-archive, which means that you take the final copy that you sent to the reviewers and you upload it, and it could be uh, on an institutional repository, 
So here's uh, Lethbridge University. They have a repository where faculty can upload their publications. Um, it could be at an institutional, uh, sorry, dis disciplinary repository. So this is uh, physics. Um, they've they've become uh, they've really been pioneers in this field. And you see here, there are 823,000 articles, fully available for download. Um, and there's a, a directory of open access repositories that host these, both institutional and disciplinary, uh, and they have thousands of them. So what's what's great is that there's this website called Sherpa Romeo. Uh, where you can look up any journal. Because the question, of course, is, you know, can I just upload things? Am I going to upload it on Pirate Bay? Am I breaking the law here? And because academics have been pushing for, um, for policies that allow this, and librarians and, and consortia, uh, we actually are in a position right now where 68% of the publishers, um, basically in the, in the English-speaking world, allow some form of self-archiving. So very often, you'll actually be publishing with Elsevier, with Springer, with Wiley Blackwell, and you already have those rights. And maybe it's after six months, maybe it's after 12 months, there might be some conditions, but typically you have some rights, and the problem is that they stipulate that the researcher has to do it themselves. And of course the result is only a few percentage of the papers that legally could have been made available to the public for five minutes spent uploading are not made available. So that's one quick thing that we can educate ourselves and we can, we can really actually make a big change. Um, and Sherpa Romeo has a list of, of journals and um, uh, publishers, so you can go in there and you can educate yourself about what the policies are. Okay. Gold open access means that the journal itself is open access. So if you're publishing there, anyone can go to that website and they can read your article and you don't have to also upload it somewhere else. And there's a variety of open access journals and it's also a number that's growing. I think the open access repository uh, Directory of Open Access Journals, I think, has more than 5,000 uh, journals right now. And you have everything from uh, journals that converted from being tall access, as we call them, uh, journals you had to pay for, to being open access, and, and this is a Canadian example. Uh, we have journals that started their life as open access, and this is a great example from Athabasca, uh, very widely read in the field. And this is the directory I mentioned. So you have, this is 5,500 journals, but this is actually a bit old. I think they have over 7,000 journals right now indexed. Um, so, gold, green. Publish in an open access journal. Publish in the journal that you want to publish in, but try to get self-archive. And I'll also show you at the end that even the ones who don't specify up front that you have that right, it's possible to ask for that right. And very often people are successful. So it's about having a little bit of guts, having a little bit of knowledge, and pushing for our rights. Why should we really care? Okay. So there's a bunch of different uh, user groups. Now, the first thing, if we think about ourselves as academics, as graduate students and, and professors, you know, what we really want to achieve is expanded access and lower costs, and costs are a big deal. I mean, go ask your librarians. I know at Toronto we spend something like $17 million a year for online journals only, okay, for U of T. So that's money that could have been spent on buying monographs, that could have been spent on you know, uh, hiring more teachers, and so on. And even with that money, there are still, and U of T has one of the biggest university libraries in the world, there are still times when I come and I say I want to read this article, oh, can't get it. We don't subscribe to that journal, right? Well, what about universities that are smaller than U of T? What about community colleges? What about universities in other countries? Um, you know, I was at the, at the library in, in this university in Varanasi, which is actually well regarded in India. They had a serials room with 40 journals, and only graduate students were allowed to enter. Now, if you have to ship paper journals to India, that's always going to be expensive and slow. Now we have the infrastructure, we have the physical capability to give them full access to the entirety of human knowledge production. And what's holding us back is legal and political and economic structures. So how can we change that? Because if you're a researcher there, you want to publish, it doesn't matter how smart you are, if you can't cite the newest research in the field, you're not gonna be able to publish in the best journals. So there's an there's a equity issue there as well. But this isn't just about academics. This is also about giving access to research for people outside of the academic sphere. And there's a lot of groups. I come from a school of education. We train teachers. We do research on teaching. We think that the research on teaching that we do matters. However, when you leave OISE, we cut you off. Well, we don't, but you are cut off. Just like you lose access to the university gym, <laughs> you lose access to the library. 
And so when you're a teacher in a school and you're trying to implement uh, constructive, uh, constructivist pedagogies, you don't have access to those journals. You don't have access. The principal doesn't have access. The school board doesn't have access. The parents don't have access. The politicians, I don't know what they do in Ottawa. Maybe they have access. But either way, that's a massive problem, right? Uh, and, and, and people sometimes tell me, well, you know, it's too obscure. People want, they won't be able to read that stuff. They're not interested. Well, you know, you'd be, you'd be surprised, right? So we have a, a, a repository in the University of Toronto. And I got access to the statistics. And it's interesting to see because you can see where people come from, right? So what did they click on to come to your repository? And so we started getting a lot of hits from Wikipedia. And I looked into that. So for example, there's this article about medical triage. So fairly specialized, very, very long article. We started getting a lot of hits for one of our journal articles. And so, you know, this is a very specialized article, but because of the size of Wikipedia, you know, they got this specific one article on Wikipedia got 45,000 hits last month, okay, of people who went to Wikipedia and read about medical triage. And who went all the way, this is like a 10 page article, they went all the way to the bottom to citation number 34, and they said, I wanna read that article. And because that academic archived that, in, in addition to publishing in Journal of Post Postgraduate Medicine, she also was able to get the right and she archived it in T-Space, which is what we call our institutional repository, and they click on that and they download it and they read it, okay? And to me, you know, Wikipedia, People say, is, is Wikipedia, does it have a place in academia, in teaching, K through 12? To me, the answer is obviously, but not as the final point, but as the starting point, right? It should be the first place you go, and it should have links to those resources where you explore more in depth. But that's not going to work if those resources are not available to normal people. So Wikipedia plus open access is a match made in heaven. Um, in that room, they're talking about open courses and, and MOOCs and stuff like that. Well, when you have thousands of people coming in to learn openly who are not part of formal institutions and who want to access, so this is an example, this could, there could be small or big courses, this is a, a, a small course that I ran on a platform called Peer-to-Peer -peer University uh, where we had, every week we read scholarly articles about collaborative learning, there were teachers there who were discussing different theories and we were able to do that because the articles were open access. But here's another course. This is a, a course that's starting actually this Monday, which seems to be very of relevance to this conference. So if you want to sign up, uh, feel free. It's run out of my institution. So far, 20,000 students have signed up. And this course will be using articles, right? The first MOOCs, they were mostly about math and physics, so they were very self-contained. Like, watch this video, do these assignments, that's all you need. Well, if you're doing a course in Aboriginal worldviews, you want people to read different points of view and to think critically. That's what we've been talking about at this conference. And so, because there are open access journal articles, we're giving those 20,000 people the ability to actually see what the experts are saying and to think critically about it. It's, it's, it's amazing. We actually have a librarian now at the University of Toronto who sp specializes in helping MOOCs um, to find open resources that they can refer to in their, um, in their learning plans. The final thing, and, and this is something that I'm personally very, very um, interested in, and I could give a one hour presentation about it, but I won't. Um, you know, what is the purpose of scholarly publication? I mean, all too often we get bogged down in tenure and promotion and CVs, and you know, we need to publish, right? Publish or perish. And I'm a grad student, I know how that works. But, you know, idealistically, there is a higher purpose, and the higher purpose is that we all went into academia because we care about knowledge and advancing the state of knowledge and learning. So thinking about it from that perspective, is the current way of organizing uh, information the best possible way? Um, you can download PDFs, it's much faster than going to the library, but the PDF, uh, PDFs actually look fairly similar to what they did 300 years ago in the British Royal Society. They're beautifully formatted, 25, why, or why are they all 25 pages? Like who decided that was the best kind of length for an article? Used to be that every movie was one and a half hours. Now people go and watch three minute videos on YouTube. Different mediums uh, actually show us that different ways of formatting information can be valuable. And so I think that there's gonna be, that there is already a lot of innovation. I think this is gonna be a groundswell, however, this is only possible with open access. So open access isn't enough by far. Um, 
but it enables things, okay? So something very, very simple. This is something I've been experimenting myself, with myself. If you're reading an article and they're citing someone, right, why do you have to go all the way to the end and you read this beautifully formatted APA citation that someone slavered over to get all the italics correct? Why do you have that citation? So someone can find the article. Well, why don't you just click on the PDF icon after every single citation and it'll directly download that PDF. Okay, this system does that automatically for every article that's open access. And that's another point uh, when we talk about how do you promote open access? How do you make people want to do it? And especially uh, academics who are a top institution, all their friends are at other top institutions, they've all got access to the library, we're not paying for it, so why bother? I would say that these kind of innovations that make access easier and more convenient and more powerful, even for the articles you already paid for, okay? I could click on that link, or I could go to my library, I can log in through the VPN, I can go to the index and catalog and search it, what am I more likely to do? So if we can sell people on those kind of uh, practical benefits, then that could actually be a great way of promoting open access as well. But this is a very simple example. There's some very cool stuff going on. Um, Nature hosted this research project, which uh, a massive um, genoma and codification project, and I'm not a biologist, so I don't know all the details, but basically I know that in some of the sciences, they're, they're talking now about big science. They have papers that are co-authored by 600 different authors, right? In this case, they had this massive project that re resulted in 41 papers being published on different aspects of the same kind of massive experiment, right? 410 authors on the main paper. Now, when you have that amount of knowledge generated, how do you present it to others in a way that's coherent, that's uh, easy for them to access. Well, in addition to the 41 separate uh, academic papers that they published in different journals, they were actually able to uh, come up with this experiment where they separated out different threads. So they said, okay, in every article we're talking about using computer code to sequence. So we're gonna have a thread called using computer code to sequence, and we're gonna take the, se the, the pieces from each article that talks about that specific thing, we're gonna list it under each other. So if you, that's what you're interested in, you don't have to read 41 papers. It's all there, and of course it links to the full paper. And what they say is, we could only do this because of open access. So here's how it looks. You can go in, it's, it's on nature, nature and code, and they have all these threads here on the left, and if you want to know about, I'm not going to read that, but if you want to know about something, you click there and you see these papers have information about that topic, click on the next screen, and boom. Here you see a section from that paper in one journal and a section from that paper in another journal, and you can keep scrolling. So a very innovative way of you know, compiling this massive amount of information, it doesn't follow naturally from open access, but it can only happen with open access. Uh, this probably looks kind of confusing, but people are also talking about, you know, how do we structure information? How can we add more semantic knowledge to our papers? Because we all know that we're being flooded with information. There's 10,000 new papers about MOOCs, okay? How do we extract the knowledge that we need? Well, what if we start encoding things? Because actually our papers, especially in the sciences, are very kind of, um, they have a very clear structure. Okay, this proves this, right? Why are you citing people? This is another thing that they're working on, a semantic citations, okay? So if you cite someone, then we have all kinds of fancy programs like Google Scholar who can tell us which, which article is cited the most. But what if everyone cites one article to say it's completely wrong and it still comes on the top of, of Google Scholar? What if when you cite someone, you could tag it and say, I'm citing this one because he said exactly the same as me. I'm citing this one because he's totally wrong. Citing this one because it's a good example of what I just talked about, right? And suddenly you can start generating these automatic trees. And they're already doing amazing stuff with uh, data mining. I want to see every paper that has this chemical reaction with this chemical reaction, even if they wrote it using different kinds of words. Again, only possible with open access. And actually, and this is a whole different discussion, because typically with open access we just say, you don't have to pay for a PDF. The ideal, and that's already revolutionary. But as Gable was saying, where we really want to go is where it's Creative Commons licensed, it's in an open you know, data format, it's interoperable, and so on and so on. These are all steps, though. Okay, there's people who are experimenting with opening up not just the final product, but the research process. 
So open notebook science. If I'm taking a lab notebook every single day, writing about not just the successful experiments, but the failed ones, okay, I'm going to put that online live. So if you're in my field, you can actually go in and see what I did. Because the problem is right now, nobody's publishing failed experiments. That's useful information as well. Okay, very soon finished. So how do we get here? That's what we're all going to talk about. But just throwing out a few things here. It's a lot of different levels that we can work at. Um, for you as individuals, publish in open access journals when you're, when you're able to do so, when that makes sense for you. Um, there's an author's addendum that you can actually, when they send you a copyright form, you can fill this out and send it in with, and you can say, I would like these additional rights. It's worth trying because nobody's ever going to, once they've accepted you and that you've gone through that process, they're never going to you know, throw you out. They're going to say, well, we don't accept that, fine. But it's worth trying. There's virtually no risk to you for trying that. Okay? So, you know, we are, basically, the scholarly public, publishing system is nothing without people publishing. So we need to realize that and stand together, both graduate students and faculty, and organize in different ways. Uh, this is uh, actually Nick Shockley's organization, Access to Research for Students. There's a bunch of other organizations that's working in this field. There's uh, universities adopting open access mandates. There's funder mandates. And just today, uh, so already the U.S. government had a mandate for National Institute of Health that said all publications that were funded by National Institute of Health have to be made public uh, open access by, I think, six months, maybe 12 months. They just today announced that they will expand this to cover um, all these other institutions, basically all big funders of research in the U.S. So they all have to develop implementations for open access within six months, and the maximum allowed embargo is 12 months. That means you can you can allow them to keep it hidden in the journal for 12 months, but after that it has to be open access. So the current mandate for NIH covers 90,000 peer-reviewed articles per year that are now freely available. That wouldn't have been it otherwise. This is probably going to cover at least twice as many as that. So massive things happening in the US. We can, of course, push our own government. Uh, and a final slide here, talking about hiring, promotion, and tenure. How do we reward those people who are making their research available publicly. Is that something that uh, tenure committees look at? Thank you. <laughs>